Okay. Well, uh, we are one minute after. So in the interest of time and with your permission, I will get us started. I will get us started again. Welcome to everybody. And thank you so much for being here with us. We are very excited about this topic this morning. I know that pain, whether it's back pain or hip pain or any kind of other pain is something that we all kind of bump into at some point in our lives. So I, I think as I've been going through the roll call this morning and waving to everybody, I think you're able to hear me. So I guess if I say you can't hear me, then you couldn't give me a wave, right? Hello, okay, thank you, Gina. Okay, so today's topic, again, it, we can all relate to this, that band, back pain really affects most people at some point in their lives, young people, adolescents, teens, uh, all, all of the age groups above, and certainly those of us as we age, we've been using our backs longer than others. That does affect us as well. You know, experts mm -hmm. estimate that, that sometime up to 80% of the population will experience back pain in their lifetime. So I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands to this group, but I'm guessing we might be above 80%. But that's why we're so pleased that Dr. Bridget Flanagan from the Core Institute was able to join us this morning. I think I mentioned to some of you um, who were dialing in a little bit earlier that we had the good fortune to zoom in with her last week. Dr. Flanagan is amazing and she is just an incredible, an incredible addition in our community. So Dr. Flanagan is a fellowship trained physician specializing in interventional spine and pain management. Before joining the Core Institute, Dr. Flanagan cared for patients as an anesthesiologist. Prior to a career in anesthesiology, and now listen to this, prior to a career in anesthesiology, Dr. Flanagan served in the United States Air Force where she served as a flight medicine specialist. During her time in the United States Air Force, Dr. Flanagan provided medical support to para-jumpers, basic training, trainees, and other Air Force personnel. I should have had my husband dial into this because he was, he was a jumper also, and, so, and he's also very tall, so he has back pain. I think the two are synonymous. <laughs> Dr. Flanagan completed her residency training at Tufts University. She received her doctoral degree from Midwestern University. Dr. Flanagan earned her graduate and undergraduate degrees, uh, graduating cum laude from Riviera College. I'm not sure I said that exactly right. And I was thinking she told us that she had been a teacher prior to the stint through the Air Force and medical school. She also has three children. And I believe one of them is about to go into high school, maybe this week or next. And so she's got a full plate. And she also shared that she has a wonderful husband who has supported her through all of this. Dr. Flanagan is an active member of the community holding multiple community and humanitarian awards for her work as a volunteer physician, ground support for special forces training and providing homeless outreach through medical education. She's also received recognition from the president of the United States for her service while on a mission in Singapore. So I think she's kind of been all over the place and she's such a young woman to have accomplished all of this and she is dedicated and singularly focused on providing care to the people in the South, in the West Valley, Sun City, Sun City West, Sun City Grand, Southwest Valley. And she's an amazing, an amazing young woman. So with that, I will ask Joyce to mute me and bring her up so you can hear what you dialed in to hear. Dr. Flanagan, you're up. Okay. Um, so all of that's true. I was a high school teacher before I joined the military. Um, and then I did anesthesia for a while. And now I do mostly pain management. I still do anesthesia on the weekends sometimes. Um, so today we're going to talk about lower back pain and the major causes. A lot of this relates to neck pain as well. So any, if you're having similar symptoms in your neck, it's associated with that as well. Okay, next slide. So we're going to talk about the anatomy of the lower back, um, as well as causes for lower back pain, and the treatment options and goals of treatment for lower back pain. Next slide. Um, so lower back pain is one of the top three reasons for a visit to the doctor's office in the United States. 25% of United States adults have back pain lasting over a day. 
um, within the last three months. Many people don't seek treatment um, because they just assume that back pain is part of getting older or they tweak their back and it will improve, but sometimes it doesn't. There's no standardized treatment regimen, but most of the time we like to start off with physical therapy because 87% of the time, roughly, back pain can improve with physical therapy. Next slide. So the anatomy of the lower back, sorry, I'm outside because the Wi-Fi in the building is terrible. Um, so if you, if it gets too loud or there's a loud truck or whatever, I'll pause. But uh, I wanted to bring a model, but I forgot to bring it out here. So there are five vertebral bodies in the lower back. Between each vertebral body, which is bone, there's a disc or a cushion. And then each vertebral body interacts with the one above and below through what's called a facet joint. <clears throat> the, where the facet joints are, um, there's a central canal that allows the spinal cord to stay safe, but there's an opening at each level where one nerve can exit. That's called the neural foramen. And if there's tightness in that foramen or this <clears throat> the opening is too small, that can be a cause of pain. Below the lumbar spine is also the sacrum, which is a triangular bone where your pelvis kind of grabs onto your lower back. And there's the sacroiliac joint there, which is another cause of pain in many people. Next slide. So here are some pictures <clears throat> to try to show you what I just said. So you can see that triangular bone in the middle, and you can see where it's labeled at sacroiliac joint. So your pelvis wraps around and grabs onto that triangular bone called the sacrum. And then above that, you can see those two square-like bones with little horns coming off. Those are the lumbar, lumbar vertebral bodies, and there's a blue disc or cushion in between. The, slide on the, uh, the picture on the other side of the slide just shows it from the back as opposed to looking at it from the front. So you can see more of the lumbar vertebrae and you can see where the sacroiliac joints fit kind of in your lower back and into your butt. Next slide. So this is just another diagram to kind of show you the facet joints. So if you look at the second picture, um, you'll see that each vertebral body, there's these little horns that stick off each side called transverse processes. That's just for muscles to grab onto to allow you to bend and twist. But between each one, there's a little opening and that's the facet joint. Those can become arthritic and you can develop pain from that. Next slide. So this is just more anatomy so you have an idea of what I'm talking about. So the square is the vertebral body. The whites between the squares, that would be the disc. Discs can get old and arthritic as well. They can bulge. They can actually protrude into the central canal, um, putting pressure on the nerves, and that causes a different type of pain. And then between each vertebral body, you see that yellow nerve kind of sneaking out. That opening is called the neural foramen or opening for a nerve, and there's one at every level allowing one nerve to leave. Okay, next slide. So the causes of back pain, facet arthropathy, that's just a fancy way to say arthritis in the facet joints, sacroiliac dysfunction. So where that sacroiliac joint is, you can have, it can be dislocated or moved or just inflamed. Nerve root impingement is when that nerve, that yellow nerve that was trying to escape through that tiny little neural foramen, when that gets pinched for some reason, either a disc bulge or inflammation from arthritis, that can cause nerve root impingement. A really hard type of back pain to treat is when you have an annular tear. So that's when the disc itself, the cushion between the two bones, has a small tear in it because it's so arthritic. You can also have muscle imbalances and disc herniations. Next slide. So treatment for back pain depends on a couple of things. We need to know how acute it is or how soon it happened. Acute back pain isn't because it's cute. It's because it happened relatively recently within three to six weeks. Anything that's going on longer than six weeks is considered chronic. Um, so a lot of times we use physical therapy and exercise for either acute or chronic back pain because muscle instability is a huge cause of back pain. And if we can control that portion of it, it can really help get the back pain under control. Other things we use would be medications and injections. Next slide. So 
So for treatments, you have the passive physical modalities like heat, ice, ultrasound, TENS unit. A lot of people come to me, they've already used most of these things. Other things that can be done would be traction. Ionophoresis is a really cool treatment that physical therapy can do. I actually had to have it done to my wrist um, last year because I sprained it and it was not getting better and an injection wasn't an option. So what they do is they have this patch, it's battery powered and they, in, they soak the patch in medicine and then they turn the battery on. The battery forces a negative charge into the positively charged area of medicine. And then that medicine, because of the charge change, is forced through your skin and into the area. So that I thought was a pretty cool treatment option. Um, and then there's lumbar supports and braces. We don't recommend these often unless there's a fracture because if you're going to use a brace, then the muscles are not gonna work anymore and they're gonna become even more weak which will ultimately just cause more back pain. So a lot of times, the only time we recommend a brace or a support is if there's an actual fracture in the area. So then you have physiological treatments because as you have chronic back pain, that can cause sleep deprivation, mood swings. I mean, if you have pain all the time, you get pretty cranky. So there's electromyographic feedback that we can use to see, is it coming from the nerve? Is it coming from the muscle? Um, there's progressive relaxation techniques and mindful-based techniques to help you get rest when you need it, to decrease your stress, because the more pain you have, the more stress you have. So if you can take stress away in other areas, it can actually help decrease your pain. And then we also use um, manipulation. So I'm a huge advocate for chiropractics, if it's safe, osteopathic manipulation, which is similar to chiropractics, massage and acupuncture, all can help with back pain. Next slide. So medication treatments, the first line medication treatments for back pain would be NSAIDs, um, ibuprofen, Aleve, Naproxen. However, over the age of 65, these become very risky because they can damage the kidneys as well as cause GI upset and bleeding in the GI system. So you have to be careful with NSAIDs. Acetaminophen, also known as Tylenol, is another great one. Most of my patients get better relief with Tylenol arthritis than regular Tylenol. I haven't quite figured that one out yet, but they swear by it. There's also topical agents like lidocaine. We use neuropathic, ag um, neuropathic agents. If you have nerve pain specifically, it helps calm those irritated nerves down. A lot of times antidepressants can be used to help with pain because also antidepressants have a nerve calming action to them. Sometimes we use muscle relaxants depending on what's going on with the muscles themselves. Steroids is another way to decrease inflammation, especially if you can't take non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, but steroids also come with cons that can over long period use, they can cause other problems. And then there's the interventional treatments that we're gonna talk about, as well as opioid pain medications. Next slide. Um, so I already discussed most of this, but once you get past the NSAIDs and the Tylenol, the next step would be opioid pain medication. Opioids are a highly addictive medication. They're regulated by the government now. They're much more difficult to get handed out than they used to be because some people have abused them and ruined it for people who actually need them. But chronic opioid use isn't necessarily the best option all the time. Um, there's risks of respiratory depression, stopping breathing in your sleep, as well as mood swings and other issues. You can't take opioids or you shouldn't take opioids if you're taking a benzodiazepine. They interact severely. Even under anesthesia, you have to be monitored at all times if you've gotten both of these because the risk of respiratory depression increases exponentially and you can literally stop breathing right in front of someone's eyes. Um, and then the antidepressants, which I already talked about, can help with the nerve pain a little bit. Next slide. Okay, so the American College of Physicians, their recommendations are that most people with acute or subacute pain, they do non-pharmacological treatments first. So it kind of stinks when you come to me for the first time. If you haven't done any of these things, I'm basically bound to try NSAIDs, Tylenol, muscle relaxants before I can give you anything stronger. Physical therapy is also required usually before I can do anything else. 
And then a lot of times insurance companies won't pay for an MRI, which I often need to do an interventional injection unless you've had x-rays. So I feel like a lot of people leave my office on the first visit a little bit disgruntled because I can't do a whole lot. Not that I don't want to, but because these are the recommendations that we follow because so many people do see improvement with these minor changes that they don't need the interventional stuff right away. Next slide. Um, so the interventional treatments that we do or that I do include epidural steroid injections, facet joint injections, medial branch blocks, which are just a diagnostic test for what's called a radiofrequency ablation or RFA, sacroiliac joint injections, kyphoplasties, and spinal cord stimulators. So we're going to talk about these. Next slide. Oh, so sorry. Um, th there was a there there was another slide, but I guess it didn't make it into this. So epidural steroid injections is what we do when the nerve itself is being pinched somehow. Basically, it's a little needle. We use fluoroscopy for all of the interventional injections. We put a little needle in under x-ray and inject steroid right around the inflammation to get rid of that inflammation, take the pain off the nerve, and usually the back pain and pain rating down the leg goes away. Facet joint injections is when we do a needle under x-ray right into the facet joint itself and put the steroid and anti-inflammatory medicine into the joint to try to decrease the inflammation in that area. It's mostly used for just back pain that's relatively new. If you have long-term back pain, facet joint injections usually aren't enough. So that's why we would do a medial branch block with a radio frequency ablation. So insurance companies require that medial branch blocks be done. They're a diagnostic test used with just numbing medicine. So what we do is under x-ray, we go down to right outside that facet joint and numb the joint. The numbing medicine lasts for about four to six hours. And we want to know, do you have pain or is the pain better for those four to six hours? If you get great pain relief for four to six hours, then you're a candidate for a radiofrequency ablation. What that is, is we go down with a little needle under x-ray again, but instead of injecting any medicine, we basically just heat up the area. Nerves send their signaling through proteins. So the heat causes the protein to change shape so that that chronic pain signal can no longer get to the brain. None of the things that I do fix your back or your sacrum or anything like that. They basically just help control the pain. So if you want it fixed, that's surgery. But if you want to just control it, then that's what I do. So we can change the shape of that protein so that chronic pain signal longer, no longer gets to the brain and the pain is minimized. Sacroiliac joint injections are just like the set joint injections. That's when a needle goes into the sacroiliac joint and we put numbing medicine and some steroid in there to just calm that joint down. And then kyphoplasties is for when you actually have a broken bone. If you have a broken vertebrae, then they ca we can inject cement into the vertebrae because you can't cast your back. So that's like a cast on the inside of the bone as opposed to the outside of the bone. And there are pros and cons to that. Most of the time, the bone will heal on its own, um, and you can try to treat it with just pain medicine for six to eight weeks because that's how long it usually takes a bone to heal. But sometimes those bones, because every time you move your back, you're kind of irritating that bone again. Sometimes that bone just can't heal up right, and so a kyphoplasty is what's done. The last one on that list is a spinal cord stimulator. Spinal cord stimulators are a little bit newer. They're pretty cool because you get to try it for a week. Basically, what it is, is under x-ray, we placed an epidural just like we would in a pregnant woman. There's a little catheter that we slide in, and then we tape it to your back with a battery. That puts the electrical cha changes over the spinal cord itself, blocking that chronic pain pathway again from getting to your brain. You get to try it for a week. If you get great relief, or if you don't, after that week, we pull it all out because we don't want you to get an infection. But if you do get good relief with that, then we didn't bring you back in. We repeat the procedure and we put the battery under the skin so that you can shower and swim again. And that's it. Do you guys have any questions? 
So as you're thinking about questions you might have, you can wave your hand and Joyce will unmute you so you can ask Dr. Flanagan. And while we're taking a look at everybody, I do have a question. When you were talking about, um, you know, some people get frustrated because there's work that you need to do when you first see somebody. So how long should somebody wait? You know, like let's say that you're working in your garden and you get up and your back starts speaking with you because you sorry. Oops. Hear you. How long should somebody wait before they try to get in to see you? Or you know, we talked about you know the chronic and the acute and all of that. Maybe give us a well, little scope. A on lot that. of doctors on this side of town are really great because they will if you go see your primary care doctor they will start the physical therapy and give you the, the, and some people do come to me and they're like, I've already done physical therapy. It hasn't helped. I've already tried like ibuprofen or Tylenol or those things and they're not helping. So from there we can get x-rays. Um, the only thing about if you need an injection, I cannot, or I guess I, I guess I should say, I will not stick a needle near your spinal cord without an MRI because I wanna make sure it's safe for me to do so. I wanna make sure there's nothing that I'm gonna injure by sticking the needle in there, make sure it's not something like cancer that this injection is not gonna help with, all those things. So um, if, you, if your back is bothering you and you take ibuprofen for two days and you're not getting any relief or you try the Tylenol for a couple of days and you're not getting any relief, then you can either get an appointment with me, we'll get x-rays or go see your primary care and they should get the x-rays. Um, if you're still that you come back, if you come to me with x-rays, we'll probably get an MRI. If you come to me without x-rays, then we'll probably get x-rays. It's a whole process. Now the government has really controlled it. A lot of it has to do with, sorry about the bird. A lot of it has to do with the, um, just the, the government controlling the opioids has kind of put them into regulating a lot of what we do now. Um, so we need certain things in order to do the injections. So I would say try heat or ice, whichever one makes it feel better is what you should use. Most of the time they say when it first starts hurting, use ice because that helps decrease the inflammation. But 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off. But after a day or two, then you would switch to heat usually. Um, and then ibuprofen or Tylenol or both, you, they don't interact with each other. So if you don't have any kidney problems, any diabetes, any stomach ulcers, try ibuprofen. If you have any of those things, just try Tylenol. And then if that's not helping within three days, you should see somebody. Does that answer your question? You did answer my question. Thank you uh, very much. We, we had another question come in and Mr. Stevens, I'll just go ahead and read this for you if you're okay with that. Um, as the issue as it relates to sciatica and the pain mm -hmm in the back and down the leg. What is the best course of treatment for that, Dr. Flanagan? So sciatica is because of an, the sciatic nerve. So a lot of people just refer to any pain down the leg, any nerve pain down the leg is sciatica. That's not necessarily correct. So the sciatic nerve is your, your fourth and fifth. They come together to make the actual sciatic nerve. And that's pain that runs down your butt and the post, the back of your leg. If you have pain that runs down the front of your leg, that's not sciatica. All of those things fall under the category of what's called radiculopathy. So radiculopathy is nerve pain from irritation of the nerve somewhere. So basically to treat sciatica or radiculopathy, we need to find out where is the nerve being irritated? Is it being irritated as it leaves the spine because of the facet joints being inflamed or you have a bulging disc? Is it being irritated as it crosses the sacroiliac joint because the sciatic nerve crosses right over that joint? So sometimes just irritating your sciatic joint, I mean your sacroiliac joint can irritate that nerve. So we need to find out the cause. So if you're having sciatica, we would want to get an MRI ultimately to find out the cause. Usually the treatment for sciatica is an epidural steroid injection where we put a needle in and inject steroid to get rid of the inflammation right around where the nerve is being pinched. So we need to know where the nerve is being pinched. Other things we can do for sciatica before the injection would be to start you on a nerve stabilizing medication, which just basically calms that nerve that's being irritated down until we can get you further treatment. 
Okay, are there other questions from the group? I saw some people waving some hands. Um, I know that some people like to enjoy uh, perhaps a, a jacuzzi or a whirlpool bath. So sometimes that helps or Epsom salts. Uh, I do see a question coming in from Jerry Solomon. Uh, doctor, is there any new technologies in disc replacement? Ooh, there is. Um, we don't do it at the core though yet. Um, so there is a, a minimally invasive procedure where they can go in with this, it's like a big needle, I guess you'd call it, into the disc itself and they deploy a little, it's like a little car jack into the disc space that holds the disc up. Um, I don't know of anyone at the core who does it yet. Thank you. Is yeah. there anything being done? Of, uh, for a while, Canada was doing the, the shots, the apricot shots. Uh, are those still being done? Not, not to my knowledge, no. Um, the core is pretty um, conservative in a lot of things. Like we don't do stem cell either. There are a lot of places that will do stem cell, but anything that's not FDA approved isn't really done here. Um, so like with stem cell and those types of things, there's no research that shows that it helps yet. And there's no research that shows what dose should you use? How often should you get them or anything like that? So um, those types of things are not things that are done at the core Institute yet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jerry. I, I know that there are some folks on this call who used uh, some, I would call it pretty progressive physical therapies that speak to perhaps ligament realignment as opposed to like a, a, an adjustment that's more of a, what you would say, cracking the back kind of thing. Could you speak to that, Dr. Flanagan? A little bit. Um, so I'm actually a DO. I studied osteopathic medicine as opposed to an MD. The difference between the two is not a lot. We, the osteopathic schools teach everything that an MD school teaches, and they also teach manipulative medicine. So how to realign ligaments, um, trigger um, muscle energy, all that kind of stuff. So a lot of times when you injure your back, if it's an acute or a recent injury, um, those things can be treated with simple massage and muscle energy techniques and realignment to line back up whatever popped out of place because the ligaments are meant to move. Sometimes they just don't move the right place. And then if you're, if you can't, if it doesn't get, is, isn't able to get back there on its own, then you're throwing everything else out of alignment. And so everything's working overtime on one side and nothing's working on the other side. So then you get weakness on the side that's not doing anything, but then everything that's having to work overtime is getting sore. So sometimes a couple of manipulative medicine techniques can just really realign everything, get everything working simultaneously again, and can really help. So I, I'm a huge proponent of that. Unfortunately, <laughs> because I went to osteopathic school and then I did an MD residency for anesthesia, I wasn't allowed to use my osteopathic skills. So now I only really feel comfortable using them on my own family members. So I don't use a lot of osteopathic techniques. There are some that you really can't mess up. So if I feel like you need that one, I can do it in the clinic. But a lot of times I will refer you to my teachers at Midwestern University who have their own osteopathic clinic at the, res at the uh, medical school and they do a really great job. You know, that's a great referral. That is a wonderful, wonderful school. And it's close. It's just at what, 67th Avenue and the 101? Yep. Or is it 59th Avenue? 67th? 59th Avenue and the 101. Yep. Very, very good. And easy to get into those. And, and they do a whole array of different kinds of care around what Dr. Flanagan was just saying. Um, I think I see somebody else raising their hand. Any other questions this morning for Dr. Flanagan? You see her contact information there. I see Mary. Mary, would you like to ask a question? Joyce is going to unmute you, so you can ask your question, Mary. There you go. There. Um, it seems like 
when I go to the doctor with back pain, they recommend either ibuprofen or Tylenol. And there's always a question of whether you should take ibuprofen for a long time or whether ibuprofen uh, will last. One of them is a blood thinner and people that are on blood thinners probably shouldn't have additional blood thinners in their system. What, uh, what do you think about that? I agree with you 100%. So if you, you, anyone over 65 should not take ibuprofen for more than a week to two weeks. Um, if you're on a blood thinner, you shouldn't take ibuprofen at all. Um, Tylenol is okay. You can take Tylenol in any of those situations, but Tylenol and ibuprofen are completely different medications. Ibuprofen is an anti-inflammatory. Tylenol is a pain medication. Ibuprofen helps get rid of pain through decreasing inflammation. So if your pain is from inflammation, then the Tylenol is not really going to do too much. It'll help kind of maybe decrease the pain because it is a pain medicine, but it won't get rid of that inflammatory process that you're having and you need something to break the cycle. So that's when oral steroids would come in if you can take those or an injection with steroids would come in to decrease the inflammatory process that you're having. Well, thank you very much. That's uh, helped. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Dr. Flanagan. Hey, Gary, uh, I see you raising your hand. Yes. Um, uh, Dr. Flanagan, I have been having an issue with um, pain, like coming up my hamstring into the bottom of my butt. And um, it seems to have started, and I know this sounds uh, crazy, but um, after I got my second COVID shot that night, I had pain that uh, I, ha I had a reaction all over um, with, um, with uh, flu-like symptoms, you know, with uh, the fever, the headaches and pain in my everything. And, but it also in this area that I'm talking about, in my butt of all things, and it really has not gone away. And I had that shot the end of February and I, am, I have trouble getting up out of a chair. Um, I, 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 my whole uh, upper hamstring area and, and everything, it seems very weak. I have I have gone. Um, I I have done some stretching. Um, I I well anyhow, I'm getting ready to probably start a series of uh, physical therapy for it at Core Institute. And um, uh, but right now I'm finishing up a session on balance of all things. So anyhow, but to the pain issue, I, I have taken some Aleve. I haven't been taking the Tylenol, um, but anyhow, what do you have a recommendation considering that I am terrified of needles and, and uh, would probably, probably rather have pain than have needles stuck in it. But anyhow, do you have- a So we have, um, we have lots of people who are afraid of needles. The people who are the most afraid of needles seem to be the one with tattoos, which I haven't quite figured out. <laughs> um, we do offer sedation for those people. So you don't have to be awake when I stick needles in you at all. But um, if you do it under um, sedation, but your pain, um, it's hard to diagnose without a physical exam. But when you get the COVID injection, you are trying to get an inflammatory reaction. You're trying to get your immune system to respond to that. So it sounds like you got great response from the COVID vaccine, but you may have, when that happened, you may have, you know, caused something to become out of alignment. And that's why you're still having this pain one-sided. Um, so it could be coming from your sacroiliac joint. The bottom is the bottom of your butt cheek. And if that's rotated or moved out of place, then you can get pain down the hamstring. It can be irritating your sacroiliac, I mean, your, your sciatic nerve, which can cause pain down the hamstring as well. You could just have inflammation because of everything that happened with the COVID vaccine. And you have a bursa that you sit on. It's a, a bursa is like a fat pad. 
um, that just protects bony surfaces. And you have one because you sit on your sit bone. There's a fatty pad there called the bursa. That can get inflamed too. And that can cause irritation. That can cause pain down your leg as well. So um, I would say try the physical therapy, maybe a little massage, see if it just calms down whatever got inflamed. And if not, you know, and add the Tylenol. Um, and if that doesn't help, then, you know, I'm happy to do a physical exam and see what we find. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great question, Gary. Thank you very much. And, and quite a thorough answer on that too. So you were talking about the fat pads. I think we all have those, don't we? <laughs> right now. Yeah. Oh, I think Darlene, do you have a question? Okay, well, uh, can you unmute or Joyce, can you unmute Darlene? Yeah, there we go. Oh, okay, um, a, a nerve, a pain from the hip on the outside of the leg, from the hip down to the knee, again, on the outside of the leg, and then kind of goes down to the ankle, could be caused by an IT band. Now I forget the long term that IT is an yep. abbreviation for. But what, how, if it is an IT band, how would you treat that? So if it's your IT band, you treat it with physical therapy. There's not a whole lot that can be done besides physical therapy, but the physical therapy can do what's called trigger points where they um, inject inflammatory or numbing medicine into the IT to help it relax. A lot of times when you have, um, so the IT band is a, is connective tissue. It's um a band of connective tissue that runs from your hip to your knee, basically. Most of the time, IT band pain doesn't go down to your ankle. Um, if you have pain all the way down to your ankle, then something else might be off, or it might be because your IT band is so tight that it's causing you to walk different, which is causing the pain to radiate further. A lot of, of um, pain causes more pain in other places because you try to compensate for the pain, and then you get more pain because now you're doing something you're not supposed to do because you're compensating. So that's part of the problem is teasing out the original cause and treat that instead of chasing all the other causes from compensating. So, but if you have IT, if it is your IT band, then physical therapy is the, the only real treatment for that. Unless you want to look into, like we have here at the core, we have Dr. Kearney. He's a sports medicine doctor. He does PRP and 10X. Those are different procedures. I, I've watched him do them. Um, they're, they're really interesting. PRP is they take blood from you, they spin it to get the good healthy cells, and then they inject that into the connective tissue to help repair any damaged connective tissue, basically is my understanding. <laughs> 10X is similar in that they use <clears throat> an ultrasound to find the damaged connective tissue, and then the ultrasound guides a needle into the damaged tissue only. The needle pokes holes in the damaged tissue while it flushes out the cells. And then that stimulates your body to repair the damaged tissue to make it better again. So those are two other options that I believe can be used for IT bands, but usually physical therapy is the only treatment needed. Okay, Dr. Thank, Flanagan. Thank, thanks, thank, Darlene. Thank, thank you. And George yeah. has one question. here. Sure, George. Yes, um, the x-rays of my back show that I have a lot of arthritis on both sides. Really? Not, not really. Uh, it, that's different than back pain, isn't it? That's different than bones, having bone problems. But I have arthritis it, just above my hips. So I, I don't know if I understand your question. So arthritis is pain in the joints. So if you have arthritis in your back, you're going to have pain in your back. Those little joints in the back can have arthritis and that can be painful and cause back pain. I'm not sure. And, and what do you do for that? So if you have arthritis in your back, there's lots of things we can do. We can do facet joint injections. We can do medial branch blocks. If the arthritis is in the discs as well, sometimes we can do an epidural for that. If none well, of those things help it, we can always try a spinal cord stimulator just to block, block the chronic pain pathway. Well, the arthritis comes and goes. So arthritis is a, is a tricky guy because usually arthritic pain is worse in the morning because you have not been using those joints and so they get stiff. So when you go to use them at first in the morning, it's really painful. 
And then most of the time, as you use those joints, they kind of lubricate back up and the pain can get a little better. But then you're feeling pretty good. So then you overuse those joints and then the pain comes back because now you've overdone it. So that's pretty much how arthritis works. Yes, that's exactly what I have. If I lay in the bed all night, I wake up in the morning, I can hardly move. Yes. So that's... But by 10 o'clock, after I've been up and around for a while, it go, pretty much goes away. Yep. So if that morning pain is really bothering you, things we can do to make sure to decrease the morning pain so you can get up and just feel like you're, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Great. Yes. Jump right out of bed. There you go. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I call on Missy with her question, I'd just like to share with this group that a few years ago, we had Dr. Kearney make a presentation on precisely what you were talking about, Dr. Flanagan, where he takes your blood, spends it, puts it back in your body to stimulate the growth of the healthy cells, which, and then also the 10X. He gave a, a very, very good presentation on that. And I know that he's had a lot of success with that. So he's been with the Core Institute for quite some time. So that's another alternative. Uh, Missy, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Good morning. Um, many years ago, I had a microdiscectomy at L5S1. And ever since then, if I get some back pain, folks have said, you should go to a chiropractor, get manipulated, et cetera. And I've been very leery of that. Should I be? Um, so if you... If you only had a microdiscectomy, then not really. The well, so chiropractics is great. Um, the the only thing that you should be leery about if is if they want to do what's called high velocity, low amplitude. That's when they pop you, that crack that they do. Because as you get older, if you have osteoporosis or osteopenia, that can actually cause a, a small fracture or a crack in the bone itself. But based on the fact that you had a microdiscectomy shouldn't deter you from chiropractic treatments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, Just make sure you have a good chiropractor. Yeah, yeah. Do you recommend anyone or you can do that kind of? I don't know any chiropractors in Arizona, honestly, because most of my contacts are DO doctors who do, DO physicians can do the same manipulations that chiropractors can do. Um, our philosophy is just a little different. So usually, not that I, I ever went to chiropractic school, but chiropractors tend to see you like three times in a week and keep readjusting you um, to line you back up. DOs, <clears throat> as a DO, we were taught that, you know, you need to realign things, but then you need to let the body kind of figure out how to keep it there. Because if you just keep realigning things over and over and over, you're just creating more loose looseness in those joints. So you want your body to respond to the realignment. Okay. So like uh, DOs will, will see you back, like maybe they'll see you twice the first week, but then it gets very spread out and they want your body to respond and they want to know, they want feedback on how did your body respond. So um it's a little bit different, but I strongly support chiropractics. I, I think they can do a great deal. If you go to one who knows what they're doing, I just don't, I, I don't know of any, I don't have time, honestly, <laughs> unless they have a kid that hangs out with my kid. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Dr. Flanagan, I've been uh, familiar with, I think it's called the Gonstead method. Is that something you're familiar with in chiropractory? Um, yeah, li only a little bit, but yes. And that speaks to what you're talking about is, is the manipulation with a pause so the body can adjust and heal and practice that way too. So yes, I can give you some names on that if you'd like. Um, any other questions this morning? This has been a great discussion this morning. Dr. Flanagan, you set the, the, the ground, the, the foundation for a wonderful presentation that really stimulated a lot of, of great questions from our group. You see, we have a very intelligent group who dial into these and they have an appetite and a thirst to learn more. So you've been a wonderful teacher this morning. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sharon, she's stepping up. And I saw that Tony, our IT guy, was on here with us this morning as well. So uh, with that, I think if there are no more questions at this point, I'll go ahead and kind of get us uh, towards the end of our, 
of our event today. So uh, Joyce, you want to help me with this? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Joyce, our IT person. Okay, great. Um, so again, Dr. Flanagan, I learned so much today. And speaking of back pain, there are new developments to share in spine health and orthopedics being made possible by the generosity of many donors on this call today. Your support is helping to transform the Center for Orthopedics at Banner Delhi Webb Medical Center into a new state-of-the-art destination for superior care. Thank you, thank you. New equipment, advanced technologies for spinal surgery, uh, lots of diagnostic kinds of advancements and service enhancements supporting so like Dr. Flanagan to keep you and your neighbors active for years to come. If you're bringing innovations, you just can't wait. These enhancements are already benefiting patients. Yeah, we're still looking, we'll still accept gifts to support this project through the Generosity for Generations campaign. The more information we know about our back pain and the treatments to manage that, the more we can stand ready to take the steps necessary to improve our health. Moving forward, it is important to know that when it comes to fully funding this campaign and the initiatives, in addition to spine care and health care, the campaign includes five other, other initiatives as well. And you've heard us talking a lot about the Generosity for Generations campaign. And of course, as we put these comments together, we had a lot of play on words around stand ready, steps necessary, moving forward, stand tall, sit, sit tall. So uh, we're pleased to share with you that we have reached 70% of the $48 million goal. We still have a ways to go. And so we invite and encourage all of your support. So that will take us to the end of this campaign for the lifeblood of superior healthcare in the West Valley and the hallmark of Sun Health Foundation's legacy that spans more than five decades. Because the foundation is the philanthropic partner with Boswell and Webb right here in your local communities, your support has and continues to make possible the necessary services and programs that empower people to enjoy living longer. Couple of upcoming events that I hope you might consider if your back is up for it, we have the 5K walk or run for women's health on Sunday, September the 26th over at the Surprise Stadium. We also are doing our in-person Heroes with Heart Gala on Saturday, November the 6th at the Renaissance Glendale Hotel and Spa. Again, that will benefit the uh, Generosity for Generations campaign that's ongoing now. We have our upcoming coffee with Gina and friends. September 30th, we're gonna be talking about diabetes, either diabetes control and prevention, featuring Dr. Hanna Musa. On October the 21st, our very own board member, Michael Barnes, will be talking about, is your money at risk? Learn the six pillars that will keep your money safe and keep you safe during this very challenging time. So with that, I would like to, Dr. Dr. Flanagan, are you over at Webb today? Because if you are, we can drop off cookies. We have a couple left. I'm at the Core Institute in Sun City West. I'm here every day. Okay. You know, we are right across from you. So we'll send Joyce or Lindsay over with a couple of cookies, if you like, because you did a great job today. Thank, Thank you. you. I love <laughs> <laughs> Well, we could even send enough for your family if you would save them. To uh, take I don't know if my kids need cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Again, as usual, you do such a great, great job on this. And we know that you're passionate about caring for the people in our community, just as we are passionate about bringing these wonderful topics to them. We appreciate your, your availability this morning to talk with our, our friends and the family of Sun Health Foundation. So with that, uh, free field to contact us. If you have suggestions on other topics that you would like in Coffee with Gina and Friends, we hope that you will continue to stay well. We hope you continue to stay safe. And we hope that you will continue to stay connected. Thanks so much for joining us and take care of that back. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. for. Thank you. Bye-bye.